Hello there, lovely people. It's Alex from Nintendo Life here, and today we're going to be reviewing for you Lonely Mountains Downhill on the Nintendo Switch. This review was originally written by the lovely John Mundy and has been adapted for video by me. But anyway, that's more than enough waffling. Let's dive right into things. <laughs> Lonely Mountains Downhill might sound like the name of a lost chapter of J.R.R. Tolkien's The Hobbit, but it's even more magical than that. It's a mountain biking game. Now, you might not think that that sounds particularly magical, and honestly, we wouldn't blame you from that alone. But as it is, we've played Lonely Mountains Downhill rather a lot, and it really is packed full of wonder. Even if you haven't sat astride a ruggedized bicycle for a couple of decades like Muggins here, in fact, I can't remember the last time I was on a bike. I don't like them, too many wheels. You owe it to yourself to at least take Megagon's game out for a spin. The whole game spells everything out that you need to know right there in the title. It's all about getting to the bottom of a handful of mountains on your bike. And don't think that that lonely part of the title is a mere poetic embellishment either. In fact, it's essential to the game's appeal. Each mountain track that you negotiate here supplies a splendid sense of isolation. There's no shouty commentator, no ground crew, no spectators, not even a smidgen of music to hint at the presence presence of your fellow human beings. It's just you, or rather your polygonal avatar, cycling through nature. The sound of wildlife, babbling brooks, and the chunky tires carving through dirt and loose rocks is the only soundtrack here. That and the sickening crunch of metal and bone as you plunge off a particularly precarious rock bridge for the tenth time in a row. You see, whilst there is definitely a sort of a zen-like quality to the game, it's not afraid to bare its teeth either. After an initial exploratory run down a new trail in which not even timed, the game will start to set you challenges. Get to the bottom in this amount of time, or with fewer than this number of crashes, all culminating in perhaps the biggest challenge of them all, Freerider. This tasks you with doing an entire trail in one run, with no checkpoints to restart from, and if that sounds simple... <laughs> <laughs> With such a multi-pronged approach, each of the game's 16 trails opens out into something far richer and deeper and gnarlier than they first appear, especially when you realise that there are multiple routes to be taken that veer well off the beaten track, some obvious and some so extreme that they almost feel like cheating. So long as you make it to the next checkpoint, the game will let such diversions slide, rewarding you with potentially massive time savings and broken bones. But all of this would be for naught if it just felt like you were riding down the shops for a packet of toilet roll, or perhaps even worse, certain motorbike games. But it perfectly nails the sensation of pedal-powered locomotion without feeling arcane or restrictive. It just really feels right. You're essentially holding ZR to accelerate with a press of the A button initiating a burst of intensive pedaling, which is essentially a turbo boost, just like any standard car racer. But way more important than these patented go-forward buttons is the nature and gradient of the surface that you're on. It's all about harnessing momentum as your biker wallows through flat sections and slight inclines before rapidly accelerating down into valleys and skidding around bank turns by the barest margin. The steering system is crucial to making you feel like you're on a bike. The default system, and by far the best in John's view, but not mine, has it so that the direction you hold the left Joy-Con stick directly corresponds to the direction your front wheel is pointed. Kind of like tank controls, if you know what I mean. In a car racer with the same kind of semi-fixed top-down perspective, this might feel a bit weird and, well, well, to be honest, old-fashioned, but here it seems to just make more sense. This way you can use the severity of the angle of your front wheel to carve in and lean hard into turns, or else leave the handlebar open and let inertia pull you outwards. The interplay between various sources of acceleration in this direct steering system just feels very right indeed. Indeed, you feel so attuned to your bike and its path through the game's lush environments that collecting enough parts to unlock a new ride is a genuinely thrilling reward. One bike might well look much the same as another, especially when rendered in the game's simplistic art style, but they each handle very, very differently and are better suited to different sections of track. As for flaws in the game, well, we really struggle to think of any be 
beyond the obvious one that you've probably already noticed. Unfortunately, performance on the Switch isn't quite up to scratch. In both docked and handheld, we noted numerous instances of slowdown and even the odd lengthy pause slap bang in the middle of a run. As you can probably tell from my enthusiasm so far, it wasn't enough to detract from our enjoyment of the game. That said, we really hope the developer addresses these technical issues soon because it's the only thing keeping it from being an absolute mastery. Even as things stand, this is one of the finest driving games on the Switch. And yes, we do mean driving. Calling it a riding game or an extreme sports game would only serve to downplay it and diminish it as a niche concern for a certain type of gamer. And really, we can't think of many Switch owners that wouldn't be thoroughly captivated by it after a single lonely run. Lonely Mountains Downhill is an exquisite bike racer come trials game with tight controls, varied courses, and a uniquely zen-like presentation. At once calming and demanding, it looks and feels like no other game on the eShop. Barring one or two disappointing technical issues, it's an absolute freewheeling delight. Trousers, trousers, it's that time again. Yes, it's time for Alex's personal thoughts, and I've actually got quite a few, um, but a bit of backstory first. I actually played this game for the first time on Switch, not, not on another system. About a year ago, I was lucky enough to get my hands on a, um, a pre-release build when I went over to Sweden. You might have seen the video. If not, check it out. It was good fun. Uh, link in the description. And I had a go with it, and they did tell me that it was fairly early on in the, uh, the porting stage, because it's out on other systems as well. Well, and <laughs> I must admit, I'm, I'm sure you've noticed um, the performance, as we mentioned in the video, is not as good as perhaps we would like, ideally, but it's it's all right, you know, it's perfectly playable for the most part. However, I've got to say, when, when I first played it back then, it ran... <laughs> I don't want to sound rude, but it was, you know, it was early in development, so it's fine, but it ran absolutely terribly. I'm talking like 15 frames a second. So in the course of a year, they've done a fantastic job getting it running better on the Switch. And it is a looker as well, you know, I know it's only a low poly art style, but there's a load of like depth of field effects and stuff like that going on. But it's not what I'm more of. I really, 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 really like this game. Um, I couldn't tell you exactly what it is and despite what John said and despite what I read out in the review, I do actually prefer the alternate form of, um, of riding around, just holding the direction you want to go in rather than using left and right sort of tank controls. I don't know, it just, it just seems to be better for me personally and I prefer it. One thing I think John did slightly downplay a little bit is the other paths you can take because my god there are so many, some that are clearly intended to be alternate paths that you can take and some where you just kind of slowly nudge yourself off a cliff and skip half of the entire area which I've done once or twice and my god is it satisfying if you do it right and you don't end up a pile on the floor. It's really bizarre to describe because as John said it is simultaneously really quite stressful and demanding and on the other hand really kind of slightly just sort of relaxing and engrossing. It kind of sucks you in and when you actually get in the zone as it were and you start you know going around things really smoothly and oh you really get a really terrific sense of achievement and then it can all come crashing to an end just just like that. It's actually one of the most interesting uses of 3D I've seen in a while. It, it reminds me do you know what it is it's almost like uh, it's almost like a modern ski free if you know what I mean that old Windows game it really is it, it takes a lot of the same principles but it's it just develops into a much richer denser experience but with that same kind of replayability the constant constant replayability it's it's just wonderful it's cathartic it makes you want to keep playing it and you lose time much more quickly than you think you would. And for a system like the Switch, which is portable, this is just, it's just a no brainer. It's just the perfect system for it. If they manage to get it running even better, you know, sort of may maybe targeting a, a 30, a solid 30, rather than the uncapped frame rate that we've got at the moment, um, then I think this is gonna be a seriously difficult game to top for what it is. It's really unique. It's not gonna be replacing Breath of the Wild anytime soon, but for what it is, Good gravy, it's good. <laughs> <laughs> 